This morning, I'm, uh, I'm reaching back to something that I shared several years ago. I think it was in 2015. And I was going through some old notes for my uh, football talks and uh, had the privilege, and I'm thankful, but uh, to work with Bath High School this year and been speaking to them every week. And uh, it's been kind of an up and down season for them, but they've been very faithful uh, to the chapel and the kids seem to be enjoying it. It's been a lot of fun. And of course, my work with ONU, but I was going through these notes and I saw this message and I was like, man, this is one of those that bears repeating. Now, it'll never be the same as it was then because I'm in a different place than I was then. But I, I hope to use this to kind of get all of our attention of understanding what it is we're really about here at the bridge. And we're going to compare and ask the question, is our church a cruise ship or an aircraft carrier? We got a picture up there. Is your church a cruise ship or an aircraft carrier? An aircraft carrier church has a clear mission that stems from the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. How many of you have ever been on a cruise ship? You lucky dogs. My wife's either A, afraid of like getting some kind of illness or B, getting stranded, or C, whatever else fear she could come up with. She finally agreed to it, and then the pandemic happened. I was just getting ready to schedule a cruise. She thought, well, I hear, man, it's so much fun, and you eat, and you eat, and you eat. And... Sound like a good trip. So, But I can't explain to you what a cruise ship looks like, because I've never been on one. But I can tell you, I've been in churches that look more like a cruise ship than a battleship or an aircraft carrier. I mean, I've, I've been at some big churches. We, we used to go to a men's conference down in Grove City. And uh, this church, like you need a map to get around. They had a, uh, a room for the kids, like they had their teaching room and then they had the playroom. And it looked like a McDonald's playland on steroids. They had like seven slides that were like three stories. Kids come flying out into a pit of balls and all this crazy stuff for kids. They had Game Boys on the wall that the kids could play with the screen. And, and, and I mean, I'm talking, that's just the kids. And then for the youth room, they had anything you could imagine to entertain students. The sanctuary set about, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 people. And one year we were there on a Saturday and the Buckeyes were playing Michigan. And so they had five big screens up in the front of that, behind that platform. And the guys were like 60 feet tall on those screens. I'll never forget watching the Buckeyes in. Talk about larger than life. It was pretty slick. And what they did was they always had a cleaning day on that, on that day. And if you cleaned the church, big, big fall cleaning, then you got to stay and watch Buckeyes beat Michigan. Of course, that's usually what happens. And uh, sorry, guys, I just got to play a little bit. But that was part of their reward. But I remember being in that church, and, and I would liken it to a cruise ship church. The difference in a cruise ship church and a, an aircraft carrier has a lot to do with being attractional. If you had kids and you walked into that kid's room, you're not looking at any other church, man. You're going there because your kids are going to be like, Mom. They got three-story slides. Mom, look at this. Take your teenager there. The activities they had. It was hard for a small church to compete. But it was very attractional. Like, we're going we're gonna to build a, a Disneyland for the church, and it's going to draw people in. But it becomes very inner committed. It, it's, it, it's all about what we can do for you. And it's, and it's very easy to attend a church like that. Because basically you show up for the show. It's a show. Now, I'm not saying they're not preaching the gospel because they were. I'm not saying they're not reaching people for Christ because they were. But the way they did it was by hoping to build something so cool that people would want to come and then we'll share the gospel with them. Well, that's okay. I'm not saying it's, a, it's all wrong. The problem is there aren't many churches in America that can do that. And that's not what the Great Commandment or the Great Commission said to do. But some people can make it work. 
It's kind of funny to ponder the idea of a church that looks like a cruise ship. However, many American churches resemble cruise ships in more ways than just their architecture. People who attend cruise ship churches, much like cruise ship passengers, come to be entertained and catered to by the staff. Pastor, I need, I need, I need. Pastor, pastor, pastor. Pastor Dickey, pastor whoever, teachers, worship leaders, great demands. Very little is expected of the church attendees. In fact, they tend to rate the quality of their experience, the music, the sermon, and the way it made them feel, much as a cruise ship passenger rate their satisfaction with the various aspects of their trip. I've never tried to make myself a great preacher. I won't say our worship team is a great worship team. They're not bad. I'm not bad. But we ain't great. But we're going to be real. We're going to be authentic. We're going to be us. We may not have the best kids ministry in town, but I guarantee you won't find people that love your kids anymore. See, it's, it's, it's that whole mentality of, what, what is it you really want? Do you want to be served or do you want to serve? And way too many people go to church every week and get served. And they do very little to serve. And I'm going to tell you, the best way to enjoy church is get involved. Don't show up. Get involved. I mean, you need to show up, yes. But you, you need to show up and do something, not just watch the show. Cruise ship churches tend to be internally focused on the needs of their regular attending members. The main goal of these churches, as on a cruise ship, is to keep the customer happy and the complaints to a minimum. Folks, I've played that game before. It's not fun living every moment to please everyone. And guess what? I can't please all of y'all. One Sunday, you're going to come out and go, man, thank you, Lord. You spoke right to my heart. And the next week, you're going, who was he talking to? <laughs> Welcome to church. I don't know what to tell you. Can't tell you how many times I've sat in church myself and go, what were they saying? I don't know what that was about, but okay. So you're not the only one. Leaders in a cruise ship church focus on the existing People rather than pursuing those far from God or encouraging others to do so. Very little of a church's calendar training or communication is spent on activities to reach the lost or help those in need outside the church. The one church that I had heard about that was such a great cruise ship church was, was located in, a, in an urban area right in the middle of one of the poorest communities in town, but they got really cheap property and some tax incentives, so they built their church there. But it was only the affluent coming. They were doing absolutely nothing to reach the community right around them. And I thought, how tragic. I remember reading a book several years ago that, that led me to think about that name, The Bridge Church. Not that I came up with it on my own, but it was talking about bridge builders and building bridges into your community. And I'm like, man, that's what every church should be. We should be called The Bridge, you know. But the point was, this pastor had built this huge church. And they're running 2,500, 3,000 people every week. And this was in a little suburb of Little Rock, Arkansas. So I became kind of sparked to what they were doing just because it was from back home. And uh, this pastor said one year they were, they were doing all these outreaches and, and nothing was really happening. And, and uh, he said they were more internal than external. And it was, it was like the church people got together and said, let's go get our friends. But he said one day he was really troubled and he, and he drove to the, to the entrance of their, their church and he looked across and here's this little old lady. The end of the driveway, first house on the left. Out doing some landscaping and some yard work. And he said that house had preceded them. He said, now neighborhoods had sprung up all over the place and they're very affluent, but she was one of the first people to live there. So he said, I'm going to drive over. And he said, she didn't see where I even came from. And I got out and I said, ma'am, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah, sure. 
He said, well, you know about that church over there? He goes, oh, it looks like a really busy place. But they ain't never really done nothing for me. Well, how many houses down this road? What do you know about that church down there? Well, it's, it's, it's grown and it's been lower and it's big again. It looks like there's some activity. But they ain't never done nothing for me. See, folks, we can get so internally focused, we forget that we could have a neighbor across the street that could use a hand doing her landscaping at 80 years old. And that's the day he came up with the great idea that I've tried to use on many occasions where you have a serve day where the church leaves the building and you go serve the community instead of just coming here and, and serve each other. And he was one of the men that kind of created that whole idea and that mantra where you step outside the building and you don't just take beds. Maybe you fix somebody's porch. Maybe you build a, a, a handicap ramp. Maybe you, you go and, and mend somebody's fence or whatever it is. But you just go serve your community. And I wonder how many of us as church people, when we leave church, we just go back into our crazy world, but we don't necessarily take church with us into our crazy world. Folks, how are we going to reach the people around us if we don't take God with us and share him with those that we know are in need. I want our church calendar to have things on it that include reaching people in the Lima community. I don't want to just be the only one that feels like, okay, a couple of us are going out and we're doing these things. Did you know that even building beds at Lowe's is going to be a huge community outreach? You're going to be working with Lowe's employees, most of which live in Lima land. And what if they like you and say, hey, I think I'm going to go to church with those folks. Look what they're doing. That's pretty cool people. They're pretty normal. They weren't even super spiritual. Be real. If you hit your thumb with a hammer, say, holy smolies. Makes you churched. That's all. Statistically, only 5% of most American churches' budgets are spent on missions and evangelism. Overall, there seems to be little incentive or empowerment of church members to get off the cruise ship and use what they learn in the world. There are, however, churches that are more like aircraft carriers. These churches are designed to empower the members to find their God-given purpose in life. The greatest gift I can give you is to help you find your God-given purpose for life. Because when you're in the center of God's will, you will be the easiest person in the world to pastor. Except you'll always be bugging me. Hey, pastor, have you thought about doing this? Hey, pastor, have you thought about doing that? Can we do this? Can we do this outreach? Can we go tell these people? And at some point, you're just going to be like, go. <laughs> just do it. And there's no greater thing than to have people in your church that are on fire about using their God-given abilities for God. And I know many of you sitting there right now are going, I'm this age and I have no clue. Then it's time you found out. And over the next several weeks, that's going to be part of our goal is to help people find what is it that I'm called to do. And I'm going to tell you, most of you are going to find out you're already in the center of it. You just don't recognize it. If you're married, you're called to be a good husband, a good wife. Hello. That's the center of God's will. Well, what if I picked the wrong one? Too late now, you done picked them. Now you got to figure it out. We're going to help you. Come on. But see, that's what happens. We, we, we don't recognize that, that sometimes we're already in God's will doing some of what God's called to do. All of us that have kids, we're called to be parents, good parents. Godly parents. Yeah, but, 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 but what are my God-given talents? Most of you aren't executing the God-given talent you were to be a great spouse or a great father or mother. Why would God reveal more of his will when you haven't done what is already known of his will? That's a hard one. We're going to help you. We're going to equip you, and then we're going to send you out to do God's work and missions into our world to reach and serve those who don't know Christ. 
Much like the crew of an aircraft carrier is all about launching military planes and equipping them well to carry out successful missions. Did you know that an aircraft carrier is the same size as many cruise ships, housing close to 8,000 soldiers? A super aircraft carrier rises 20 stories above the water and stretches 1,092 feet long. That's about like the 77-story Chrysler building is tall out in the water. But what distinguishes an aircraft carrier ship isn't its size, it's the efficiency on the flight deck. The crew of an aircraft carrier can launch a plane every 25 seconds, all in a fraction of the space of a typical landing strip. The mission pervades every aspect of the ship. From the pilot to the person who restocks the ship's vending machines, everyone knows his or her particular role and how it supports the mission. To equip, prepare, launch, and receive aircraft carriers or aircraft back from their crucial assignments. Back in the day, we had Top Gun. I think they came out with another one. I haven't seen it yet. But I just remember the coolest part of that movie was watch them go on and off that aircraft carrier as a kid. You know, I'm like, whoa. Then they got like a slingshot net that catches them if they start going over, you know. And it stops them. They break on a dime. They take off on a dime. And it's all about doing what it was created to do. And everybody has a part. I wish everybody at the bridge would start to recognize there's a role for me to play at the bridge. I may not be the pilot. I may not be the preacher. I may not be the singer, but I can be a greeter. I can be a helper. I can be a servant. I can help with funeral dinners. I can help with the youth. I can help with kids. But folks, God's got something he wants all of us to do. See, an aircraft carrier church has a clear mission. That stems from the great commandment and the great commission. Everyone in the church knows why their church exists and can play a role in the mission. The annual budget, weekly sermons, monthly calendar, insider and outsider communication. And predominant conversations are all consisted with the stated mission of the church. Some of you don't know that we have a mission statement. We're going to develop it a little more, but we do have one. We desire to reach our community with the unchanging message of hope that is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We will earn the right to share Jesus by building bridges into our community, by how we conduct our lives and through acts of love and service. To me, that sums up exactly what I want to be about as a pastor for the rest of my life. Tell people about Jesus. Guys, he's their only hope. Our church isn't their hope. I love you, but we're not that good. The church isn't the hope. Jesus is the hope. Church is where we get together and share the hope and encourage people and, 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 and move people into action and give them a place to find God's will for their life. How do we reach them? By building bridges into our community, by how we conduct our lives, how we live, how we, how we do business. And folks, we should be the most generous and kind people in every business that we frequent. And it's just not the case. It's not the case. I know I've had people that I know are believers. Back when I sold cars, they treated me like a second-class citizen, man. Looking down their nose at you, talking to you like you're some kind of, my dude, I'm just trying to sell a car and make a living. What's your, what's your problem? Right? I've seen it in our body shop. Man, God knows we see it in our service department. And it's sad when it's preachers. We had a preacher just this week out there, Tom Alls, that showed himself pretty bad, I guess. I was like, man, come on, you're making my job harder. And church people, how we treat others matters. And they, it's funny how people know if you go to church or not. It's kind of cool how that happens. And they know how you should live better than we do sometimes. So the question I want to ask you today, is our church more like a cruise ship or an aircraft carrier? Are we following the Great Commission? 
Matthew 28, 19 through 20, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What does that mean to go and make disciples? That means go and not just tell them about Jesus, but folks, then we come alongside them and we walk through how to be a Christian. And we let them see us fail. We let them see our imperfections because too many people, uh, when we try to disciple someone else or help someone else, we want to hide our imperfections. We want to hide our failures. Listen to me. People need to know that you don't have to be perfect to be a Christian. Come on. Are you guys out there today? I need to hear that you don't have to be perfect to be a Christian. You just have to be perfectly forgiven. And on that journey, you will have trouble. You will stumble. You will have times where you fail. But with God's help, you say, I'm sorry. You get forgiveness. You stand up and you keep walking forward. When's the last time you put your arm around a new convert, a new person that received Christ and said, hey, I want to walk with you on this journey. I want to help you find God's will for your life. Well, Pastor, I don't even know God's will for my life. How am I going to help somebody else? Maybe helping them, it'll help you. I don't know. <laughs> and then the great commandment, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commands. Two things, folks. Love God. Love each other. And the more we love God, the more love we'll have for each other. And he even makes the unlovable tolerable. There are 10 indicators, and I'm not going to get to all these today because I'm, I'm on a time frame. I got my timer running. 10 indicators that might help you assess whether your church is an aircraft carrier church or not. Church, church leaders have a missional versus attractional mentality. They see their job as equipping and mobilizing people inside the church to effectively reach the multitudes outside the church. Consistently preaching about the importance of the great commandment. Loving God and loving others. Lord knows I preach it a lot. And I know people probably get tired of hearing it. But until we all start doing it, I'm going to keep preaching it. I'm pretty sure you guys are asleep today. I have lulled you completely to sleep. Second thing, church and lay leaders have non-Christian friends. I love telling the story, not because it's a good story, but I'd never really thought about it until I was in this situation. One year I was at a, they call it a district council meeting, and, and our superintendent happened to be speaking that day, and, and uh, he asked a question. I'm about the sixth row in, so I'm pretty sure I heard him. But he asked the question, how many of you, and it was predominantly pastors in the room, have close, unsaved friends? Well, when nobody else around me was raising their hand, I started to put my hand down because I thought, uh-oh, I didn't understand the question. This is a true story. And the pastor said, hey, Randy Davis, keep that hand up. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm thinking I missed the question. And he uh, proceeded to say, okay, I see two hands. He goes, folks, we got a problem. When the pastors don't have unsaved friends, but you've got a problem. Never thought about it before then. But folks, we can't be so close to Jesus that we can't be close to sinners. Because honestly, Jesus hung out with the sinners. He despised the church people of his day. And he loved sinful people because he knew he was their hope. I'm not telling you to abandon church people and never have fellowship with Christians, but you can't abandon the lost because they're different or, or I, don't, I don't think I can relate. Man, you got everything that person needs. They just don't know it yet. So do you have unsaved friends, close friends? I still do, and I'm going to continue. 
We need to give a, a sizable portion of our church budget to reaching others, to missions, to outreach. And I can tell you right now, as a brand new church plant, we give a minimum of 10% away every month. We're just doing it. And sometimes I look at it and I say, man, that's, that's like $5,000. We could, we could probably use that $5,000 for something in the church. And it's like, nope, non-negotiable. If, if we have to tie 10% as, as family members, then the church is going to tie 10% collectively. Just going to be done. Know that. We have partnership with great ministries like FCA and Heartbeat. Fellowship of Christian Athletes has got huddles all over the area. Heartbeat, helping unwed mothers raise babies, making sure they don't have an abortion. There's nothing better to give to. Fifth thing, people in the church are willing to be sent out and follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of intimidating to knock on that door, delivering a bed when you're not sure exactly what's about to happen. And it's not like we're going to the nicest neighborhoods, folks. When I went on was a trailer park where you could see through the holes in the walls outside. And it stunk and it was filthy. But it's got a brand new bed in that back room. And I bet they got some happy kids. The church and its members are known in the community for making outsiders feel welcome and accepted. How are we doing with that? I wonder how a guest feels when they walk through that door. Now, we have a lot more guests seemingly in the second service than the first. But, man, sometimes I wonder, do they ever get greeted? Do they, do they feel welcome? Do they feel what we feel from each other? Because, man, when we got fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, we know people. It's easy to get locked in and say, hey, Tim, how you doing, man? Brother, did you have a good week? And, and, but me and Tim can talk anytime, right? A new person comes in, we get one chance to have a conversation. Do you greet them? You say hi. Do we forget about it? Well, or sometimes they walk in and you go, I can't believe that person came to church today. All the more reason to have a conversation with them. Come on. Risk taking is valued in outreach efforts, even when it fails to produce fruit. I used to argue with a board that said, we're doing all this stuff for these kids at Lima Senior but they never come to our church. I said, we don't do it to get them to come to our church. We do it to tell them about Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if they go to church with grandmama, they're probably better off because she's going to smack their head if they miss. Amen? We're not going to do that. But it don't mean you don't try to tell them about Jesus because they're not going to come to your church. If we only do outreach to get people in here, then we're, we're the cruise ship. We do it because it's the right thing to do. The church is committed to prayer as a regular spiritual practice. And we pray for those outside of the church seeking wisdom to reach them effectively. Folks, Wednesday nights has got to grow. Not go, it has to grow. What we're doing, it's not much. It's not labor. I'm not going to wear you out. Most of the time we're in and out. It's like 30 minutes long. It's, it's, it's a quick devotional. It's some time in prayer, but it's 15 minutes of concentrated. We're focused on praying for the bridge in our community. It's important. And the more people come to that, the more people will come on Sundays. It's just, it's the law of the harvest. We'll reap what we sow. I implore you, if you can at all, come on Wednesday nights. That's our main part of our prayer. Not that it's the only part. Nine, there's a genuine dependence on God that is reflected in church decisions, activities, prayer, and worship. Folks, if God don't help us, we will not succeed. I heard it said by a friend of mine, he didn't coin the phrase, but I've used it. Attempt something so big for God that unless he shows up, you're bound to fail. Starting the bridge was that. If God didn't show up, Number one, I didn't want to go. And if God didn't show up, we wouldn't be here. God's showing up. Let's make sure he still is. And last, new believers are emerging and baptisms are occurring regularly. I'd like to have more baptisms. I'd like to have more people receive Christ. But it's coming. I had a girl text me the other night, 10 o'clock, and said, Pastor, I need to get baptized. Can I get baptized the Sunday after Thanksgiving? And I said, yes, you can. Now, how many else need to still get baptized? There's the next one that's going to happen, and it's going to be awesome. 
while these indicators are important, the pastor's desire to become the captain of aircraft carrier church is probably the first step in the transition from being a cruise ship to an aircraft carrier. I love that you love me as your pastor. I love that. I don't want you to hate me. I don't want you to despise me. Grow up and say, I can't wait to get out of that church. I don't have to listen to him anymore. I want to be loved. I'm, I'm normal. I'm human. But folks, I can't be the attraction. It has to be Christ. It has to be Jesus. It has to be Jesus in us. You can like that we think alike and that we, we have a lot of the same heart. That's good. I get that. But it ain't about me. If you only get me out of this, we're all in trouble. We got to get Christ in the center of everything we do. And it won't matter who's preaching that day. Christ is going forth and lives are being changed. Period. That's what I'm looking for. And I can tell you today, your heart, my, your pastor's heart is to be the captain of an aircraft carrier. Because number one, I think they might let me get one of those, those uh, airplanes. But okay, getting back to the church. Seriously. I want to take care of you. I want to meet your needs. But that can't be the primary focus. It's got to be making disciples in here and still reaching out there. And that's what's got to happen. It's going to take all of us because I can't disciple all of you. But together we can disciple each other, grow in our faith, and reach more people to grow in their faith and just keep the cycle going. Which one are we going to be, Bridge family? Cruise ship or battleship? No, nah, I don't even sound right. Aircraft carrier. I want to reach people. I'm glad you're here. I'm looking for the next batch to fill these holes. Amen. Let's stand. Father, in front of me are some of the best people I know in this community. I can honestly say I care for them. I care that they know you. I care that they're coming and being a part and being faithful. God, I care that they know you as their Lord and Savior and that they grow in their faith. And that, God, they get to the point where they know your will for their life. And they do everything every day to be in the center of your will. God, so many of us make it super spiritual or a leadership position in the church when that's some of the least of what they should desire. God, help us to recognize our role in our home. It has to start there. God, help us to be found faithful to each other, to care for one another, to help people when they're growing in their faith, to not look down our nose or judge them where they're at, but always to extend a hand to help them get to where they need to be through love and kindness. And God, let us be a witness to those around us this week. Let us be your hands extended in our community. And let us make a decision to serve you like never before. In Jesus' name. This morning, before we close, I'm going to give an opportunity. Maybe you're one of those folks that's been coming, but you have yet to say yes to Jesus. You've not said, God, come into my life. Change me. It's time. The only regret you'll ever have about putting Christ first in your life is that you didn't do it sooner. It's the only one. And I don't care how young you did it. You wish you did it sooner. The pastor don't really relate to me. So I, don't, I don't really understand it all. And you never will. You never will. I know seasoned saints that have moments where they're going, man, I didn't sign on for this. Because there's things that happen we just don't understand. But understand this. If he's with you, you will get through it. Are you here today and you need to say, Jesus, come to my heart. Come to my life. If that's you, I'd like you to come down. Let us pray with you.
Don't put this off. Don't, don't wait another Sunday. Well, when, when so-and-so, something, something. Today's a great day. Say, Jesus, I surrender. Is there one? Would you come? Christians, pray. You don't have to feel like an outsider anymore. Don't just be a part of the bridge. Be a part of God's family. It's way more important. Man. Father, work on their heart because I know you're drawing people today. Lord, I know the fear factor of just making a step and coming forward. I get all that. But God, you desire us to have a relationship with you. So I pray right now that you will draw each of these folks to yourself. God, help them to pray that prayer, to ask you for forgiveness, to ask you to come into their life. And Lord, make a transformation. We thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you go. Be a witness. Be Jesus' hands extended into our community this week. And see what God can do through you. Love you. God bless you. See you next Sunday.